Boom, we're on. And this week's episode is brought to you by Platinum Wave Campers, the UK's leading stockist of luxury Volkswagen camper vans. With locations up and down the country, Platinum Wave Campers are on hand to bring your vision to life. So whether you are looking to start working on a custom built project or find your dream Volkswagen Transporter, this is a place to look. Ever dreamed of owning your own Volkswagen camper van? Well now's your chance as you can save £500 by using the code JAMES500. All you have to do is speak to one of the friendly sales team and say that James English sent you there. Now, let's get into the episode. You can now follow me on all my social media platforms to find out who my latest guest will be and don't forget to click the subscribe button and the notifications button so you're notified for when my next podcast goes live. Boom, we're on. And today's guest, we've got John Massey. How are you, John? Very well, James. Thank you. Nice to meet you. Nice to be, for you to be here, mate. Thanks for taking the time out to be here. Fascinating story. Spent nearly 45 years in prison for murder. 43. Four, 43. Four prison escapes. Like, pretty mad. You only got out a few few years ago. First and foremost, how are you? Um, I've had a few health problems. I had a couple of strokes. Uh, when I come out, I'm still... Have a little bit of difficulty with speech and that, but otherwise I'm all right. Thanks for coming on today to tell your story, fascinating story, like I says. I always go back to the start of my guests, where you grew up and how it all began. Yeah. I, I was born in Camden, um, but mainly I was brought up in Hoxton, Shoreditch. I'm now living in, back in I'm now back in Camden, where I've got a nice little flat. And uh, things are not too bad. How was school? P pretty much of a non-event. I was uh, always playing truant. In the end, uh, I, did, I got most of my education in a pro school, which was, is what the Americans call a reform school. I don't think they exist, exist today, do they? Not sure. Yeah. What about uh, upbringing with parents, mum or dad? Um, yeah, we, it was a bit of a poverty stricken childhood where there was seven of us living in two rooms, basically. And, uh, I think it was, uh, my dad was in prison sometime, uh, which is when I went up, ended up in the first children's home, you know. What was that like? Well, that was when I was three years of age. Can you it remember was, any of that? I remember it perfectly because it was traumatic for me. Because uh, I remember my mum, I was, we was walking down this country lane holding her hand and uh, come to a little pond in the middle of a crossroads with frogs in it. I remember playing with the frogs, little baby frogs. And the next memory I've got is uh, greeting this tall, thin woman with a big starch collar who was obviously the matron of this children's home. It was a bit of a, a, bit of a big old country house. And now she took me into the garden and she pointed this little red tricycle in the middle of the lawn said, would you like to ride the bicycle? Well, I was, uh, of course I would. Uh, I was a kid, I wanted to, uh, yeah, I loved it. So I got on the bike, I did one lap of the lawn. As I come back round, my mum had gone. It was like a distraction technique, you know. And I screamed fucking blue murder from, from then on. Do you think those things affect you to become the character who you ended up becoming? I think they do, because who can remember when they were three years old? Nobody. You know, you can only remember things if they have a severe traumatic effect on you. Because my mum at the time was my world, you know. 
you, you can't envisage living without your mum when you're a little kid, can you? you know? Did you ever see her again? Of course I did, yeah. And, the, and I know my mum uh, did it for the right reasons. She was as heartbroken as I was. But she couldn't cope with, uh, you know, six kids on her own when my dad's in prison. And uh, and I was a bit sort of bit of a live wire boisterous. So she couldn't cope with me, you know. So I I, I know mum mum loved me, and and that's all I need to know. What was your dad in prison for? Uh, he was a bit of a, a bit of a face in his time. I don't really know. He was very uh, secretive about his life. I didn't know his whether he had a mum or dad or brothers or sisters. I never knew anything like that. He was born in Birmingham, the Bullery, and he wore the old cheese cutter cap. I thought he was one of the Peaky Blinders. <laughs> uh, he may have been, I don't know. But um, he was like, in them days, like the man's man, you know, strong, silent type, and the woman should be in the kitchen and the man's bringing in the bread. Did you have any happy memories as a kid? Oh, for sure, yeah. But, um, which is the thing, it doesn't matter how, how poor you are or what little you have, you can still have great fun and, you know, take joy in life. Yeah. You know. When did the, did the violent streak start? Was there patterns from an early age before you went to prison or was that, yeah, did it gradually well, come? Unfortunately, I, I don't blame my, my dad. My dad was very violent, but I've come to terms with that by accepting that he was a victim of his own generation. So if I came in from the street crying that some kids whacked me or, or whatever, He'd give me a bigger beating. He said, get back out there and fucking do him. Don't you dare come home until you... And he turned me into a lunatic, you know, because I was more frightened of him than I was the so-called daddies of the street, you know. Were you in Boston? Yeah. What age? 16. What was that experience for? Uh, it was run like a military style Short, sharp camp, yeah. yeah, and I escaped from there twice as well. I, everywhere they banged me up, I escaped from. <laughs> yeah, I, I couldn't tolerate uh, being locked up. It just seemed an unnatural process. And um, well, funny enough, that that children's home I just spoke about was my first ever escape. I they used to put you in bed at lunchtime after lunch or over for, for an hour or so. And I couldn't sleep. I was too much alive, you know. I'm like, how can you go to sleep when you, you've got so much energy? So in the end, they got so frustrated with me, they took me into a surgery room and strapped me to a gurney. But I found a way to wriggle out and undo the clips, jump out the window and they, Invariably catching me half a mile down the road, yeah. So that was my first escape. What was that feeling like running away from there? Well, did I you didn't. feel free? Yeah, for sure, yeah. I, but I didn't have a clue where I was going, or I just thought I'd try and make my way home, you know. What did you get sent there for? Boston. Well, well Boston, I think it was um, truancy and shop breaking. You know, petty crime. Yeah. From I got it in Bow Street um, Juvenile Court. What age did you get out? I got out at, uh, no, I didn't go there at 16 because I got out of there when I was 16. So younger? Yeah, because I remember being in Stanford House when I was 12, 13. And actually, yeah, that was where I've had the first taste of isolation, punishment cell, bread and water. You ask people about bread and water the day they think you're, you're making up. But they literally used to starve you for three days with dry bread and a jug of water. 
that was all you, you had to eat, you know. Was that if you had been bad? I'm sure or? it was illegal in that age, but they still gave me three days bread and water. Was that because you had been a nuisance in there? Yeah. I what? escaped from there as well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you must have been a fucking nuisance. So, so when they got me back, they put me in a secure unit inside um, this juvenile remand home. Were you ever getting any tests there as a kid? For what? Just mentally, like for to see how you were like escaping and um, misbehaving and getting no, put through all that no, trauma. Not that no, I can recall, no. Just no. that case of isolation. All, all you got was punishment, really. You know. How does that make you then rebel? And because you're already rebelling anyway, but yeah. once you're going through all that as well, did you then become anti-authority? Absolutely, and I'm still anti-authority to this day because um, I don't see how they call this a free country if you're being dictated to all the time. You know, all right, uh, there's certain laws that everybody has to obey, but but it seems to infringe on civil liberties a lot these days, you know. Did you have any friends in Boston? Or was that a kind of yeah. one-man show, just every man for himself? No, I had, I, had, I had friends. I had friends in it everywhere I went. In fact, uh, the friend I made in Borstal turned out to be my bank robbing partner for come the future. So, and we ended up being a two-man team. And uh, we got fed up with jumping out of backs of transit, six and eight-handed, you know. And they only wanted to work in the winter where they could wear an overcoat of a sawn off shotgun none whereas we wanted to work all year round you know <laughs> so so <laughs> so we changed the rules and and it worked out quite well so, so what is so you're through Boston from a very young age isolation tormented trauma beatings all the usual suspects when you're in these kind of things years yeah. from the 60s 70s but so when you get out was it just crime straight away in your mind to then start making money when you get into the serious stuff um, I wouldn't say it was um, up most in my mind to, to be a criminal. I just wanted what I wanted, basically. And um, I had to break the rules to get it. What age did you do your first bank? Um, I was quite late in life, I, was, I guess about 24. What was that experience like? Fucking nerve-wracking. Uh, I remember the, the moment you go on to a bit of work, you you got butterflies. Well, my, my mate, he had to sit on the toilet for half an hour before a bit of work, you know. But, um, but I understand the nervousness. But once you put one foot into the ring to begin it, all that evaporated and you become calm, you clear, everything was clear and you knew what you had to do. And it worked great. How much money back then? Oh, no. I, the reason I got a life sentence was um, because we had so much money, we didn't know what to do with it. It was sort of coming out of our ear holes. And I, I've, I couldn't find enough hiding places for it. We both bought houses. We both bought, a, like, we had a boat. We had a, the old Aston Martin. He had a Bentley. We just didn't know what to do the rest of the money. So we had a meet one night to uh, perceive, perceivably buy a couple of businesses, you know, so we could have uh, a little bit of legal income coming in. And because the guy didn't show up at this meet in this pub, by the time we realised he ain't, he's not coming, we sort of got the flavour, we stayed out all night, and that's when... Uh, had the row in the club and the shooting happened and, and so, I spent the next 43 years in prison. So your life before that was all glitz and glam, bad boy. It was lovely. Doing yeah, a few robberies, cash. Yeah. Were you violent before that then? Did you ever have like... No, I, was it just, not, I wasn't overtly violent. I was only violent if I was mistreated. And then, and then fucking God help you, you know. Mm -hmm. I don't care who you are then. No matter, because everybody, it was a case of uh, 
you leave me alone, I'll leave you alone. You know, that's all. So at 26 years old, you... I, I, I actually detest violence, although I've had so much of it. It kind of ruins you, it poisons you, it corrupts you. I can't understand people that do um, gratuitous violence. It, it don't make sense to me. It has to be for a reason, you know. Yeah, because you've experienced it your whole life. Well, when I was in Spain, when I was on the run, people come up to me and try to offer me hundreds of grand to go and shoot people. And I'd, I'd ask them a question, I'd, well, why? What's he done? I mean, it don't matter what he's done. You know, I said, well, it does to me. Because I said, if he's a, a fucking wrong and he's left your kids without food, or he's fucked your family up, I'd do it for nothing. But if it's a silly excuse, uh, you caught him looking at your wife or something soppy like that, I said, I'd rather shoot you, you cunt. <laughs> <laughs> so money, yeah. it didn't come into it. It was a principle, mm -hmm. you know. So 26 is a, the night your life changed, you get life, you end up spending 43 years in prison, you yeah. got a son off shotgun, blasted a man. What was the run up to that to that night? Uh, that, that day, was that the day you had a meeting with somebody about yeah, that, business? that was the day I had the meeting in the pub and the guy never materialised. So, so we'd been in there about an hour waiting for him and drinking. So, so as I say, we got the flavour, we decided to do a pub crawl, you know. <clears throat> and we ended up in this pokey little nightclub in Hackney, the Crickers. Uh, where we was, it was a lovely atmosphere. Everybody was singing, dancing. Everyone was feeling great. We was buying people drinks. But it just so happened that certain people took offence to us. Uh, thought we was a bit flash because we were spending too much money or, or whatever. I then decided it caused an argument. And it just, it just went up like a tinderbox, you know. Escalated. Yeah, and uh, next thing you know, well, we met a guy down there who was a friend of my partner. We was on our way out of the club. We sort of fought our way out of the club and got out. And we heard this, these blood-curdling screams coming from within, and we realised it was his mate left behind. Uh, he's... Johnny Dove, his name was, put, uh, yeah, we, went down to, we had to fight our way back in to get him out. And he'd been glassed in the eyes, uh, and it was horrific. His, his eyes were laying on his cheek like a sliced onion. And naturally, uh, we put it down to the bouncer. And uh, bouncers in them days weren't employed for the diplomacy. They were employed because they were thugs. You know, they were violent people. Anyhow, to cut a long story short, uh, it just was unfortunate that near that area, we had a flat where we kept our arsenal, you know. So we tooled up, had a, about three guns each, and we went back, knocked on the door, and the bouncer answered, and I had no intentions whatsoever of shooting anybody. Just wanted to get hold of the perpetrators and give them a bit of likewise treatment, you know. But he happened to throw me a punch while I got a gun trained at me. It was just, and the rest of his history, he just pulled the trigger un unintentionally. What was that feeling once you found out he was dead? Well, I was in a role play at the, at the time. It, I just carried forward with the forward momentum and. Carried on into the club and, uh, but now, you know, obviously now, or even then, if I could have pressed the button, brought him back to life, I would have done, you know, because I don't, I don't really believe he deserved to die for, for whatever. He's just another misguided person, yeah. I don't know. When did you find out? John, that he was dead? Well, 
I kind of knew immediately because no one could have survived. Uh, I mean, I was armed with two pistols and a, a Remington automatic shotgun, and it was a shotgun I shot him with. And it was such close range, it just no one could have survived it. Yeah. And where was your other two friends at this time? He was busy rounding up the other people, you know. It was a bit, bit like an old Wild West movie, was shooting up the bar and everything. You know. But the, the people that were responsible escaped up, up the stairs. There was, a, there was a club at the bottom and a pub at the top. And they came, they escaped up through the pub and out the door. So uh, we, we'd already taken our friend to hospital by then. That was the first thing we did, dropped him off at the emergency department at Hackney Hospital. And he's blind, he's been blind to this day. But no one ever mentions him, you know. So uh, there were three victims that day. Well, more than that, because our, each of us have family, you know. So we're all victims, really. Yeah, it has that ripple effect. Do you think yeah. more people could have died if they never escaped? I wouldn't say that, no, because our, our original plan was to line up, get the people responsible and maybe give them a few cuts and bruises, you know, but never... Uh, killing anyone was never in my consciousness. I can't say from your friends or whatever. But it was never in my consciousness. I got classed as a ringleader at the time because I was the one who pulled the trigger, but uh, I don't know. So after that then, you found out a man has been murdered. What do you do then? Well, my I just had a young baby at the time, Sarah. She was only eight months old. And she was staying at my friend's house with his wife while we was out. So that was the first job, to go and pick my partner up, Marilyn and Sarah, put in the back seat of the car. And I had a bungalow in Essex at the time. And uh, I was almost home when I was, realised I got a, picked up the tail, a police car. But on the corner of my where I lived was a local constabulary. And I thought, well, just maybe they're heading back to base. But in my heart, I asked, I knew. It was. But I couldn't do anything because of the wife and baby in the car. So anyhow, I can't, carried on to where I live. I uh, pulled into the driveway. By the time I pulled into the driveway, the street was absolutely flooded with police, police cars and vans. And I had a semi-circular semi drive where you could drive in one, one way and out the other. And they blocked off both ex entrance and exit and then blocked off the cul-de-sac. I lived in a cul-de-sac as well, so I was, I was like triple boxed in, you know. And then I got them indoors out of harm's way and then uh, I, I pulled the gun out again, they all scattered. I jumped back in the car Bad, the panda out of the driveway like a cardboard box. But I couldn't get past the rover and the police van. So uh, I thought, I got out of the car. I walked towards the patrol car. I thinking, fuck it, I'll, let, I'll take the patrol car. By the time I got there, they pressed all the buttons and ducked down out of view, you know. So I was left with limited options then. I thought, how the fuck do I get out of this? So I fired a shot at the, the blue light. Uh, but I found out I missed that and it went, it hit the top of the windscreen in the rubber surround. But when the bullet hit, the, the rover reversed it 30 mile an hour and you couldn't even see a driver, you know. But that, uh, that gave me enough gap to get through. So I run back to the Aston Martin, got in, bump, out. Uh, you know, I had this big long chase for about 20 minutes. And uh, it was hairy. 
I, I still get goose pimples now when I think about it, you know, because if they'd have called me, they would have shot me full of holes, you know. I'd have been like a colander. But anyway, cut long story, I, I've gone hit this last roundabout and they've got it all blocked off. I had nowhere to go, couldn't go left, couldn't go right. So I thought, fuck it, I went right over the top. Then I come out the wrong side of a dual carriageway. So I put the headlights on, full beam, holding on to the horn and just towed it. I was lucky it was early hours of the morning, there wasn't a lot of traffic. And then I realised that, well, the police had gone, had gone down the right side. And I realised after a while that I've got a right turn and they haven't. So I took them over a couple of more intersections, chucked a right, went around a few turnings, left the Aston Martin in someone's driveway and nicked their clapped out called Tina. And uh, all of a sudden I, I come to another roadblock, they waved me through. as it, I got away. See, when you say they were... If they shot you, they'd have killed you. Oh, absolutely. They sometimes were pissed, mate. Yeah, they were absolutely pissed. They sometimes have a... Well, I shot actually hit the back window of the Aston Martin, a big crack, and I, I still got a bit of shrapnel in my back now. Do you ever wish sometimes that they would have? Yeah, I, not really, no, because I don't want them to win, you know. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> yeah, I know what you mean, but... But, but, yeah. but I know what you mean, yeah. yeah. Yeah, Do you know what I mean? Course. Like yeah. everything and fucking like it's yeah. a weird question to ask, but it's just good to understand like how people are feeling at certain times, certain mm. moments, like going through that experience. Like it's fucking nuts. Like well, how, I, I didn't know what it was like to give in, really. Which is uh, <coughs> which was what made me and my partners <laughs> so successful with the bank robbery. You know, I mean, we did things two-handed that. The, the established bank where we was doing eight-handed. But we felt so confident in each other's loyalty and abilities that we, we we were prepared to take on anybody. He didn't know what it was like to give in, nor did I. It's like after, when I said we come close one day, we got pulled by a, a patrol car after we just had a Group 4 van outside the bank. But the problem with working two-handed and having one car is you've got no plans, you've got no route, you've got no change of a car. We just did it. We had to be in the right place at the right time, you know. We're cruising the streets, we see a van pulled up, we'd have it on the spot. Kamikaze? Yeah. Well, not particularly kamikaze because uh, we were pretty confident in our own abilities, you know. But this particular time, we were driving, and it wasn't sh too long afterwards that the sirens were getting closer and closer and closer. We thought, fuck it, we've got to bail out of this car, get out. So we bailed out, and we're in this sort of unknown area. And my, my mate's got the, the bag with the money. He's even got my gun in there. So I'm trying to fit up a, another car with my keys. As I'm doing that, I see this patrol car come down the street. Oh, fucking hell, yeah. A beautiful summer's day. It was June day, I remember. People were sitting in their front gardens. East Ham, it was. And they were looking at, you know, their neighbours go, look at the, the old building, go by. Half hour later, they see us coming back. <laughs> and then we duck down this side turn, in thinking we'd find a walk through to get a get away we walked into another dead end and the patrol car pulled up right beside us and my mate said like leave it to me I'll do the talking and I said I thought we ain't fucking talking the way out of this you know give me my gun give... they said no don't worry anyway I think the causes no straight away they ran the window down and said um, morning chaps I said good morning I said, you've been in the area long, have you? I said, well, no, mate, we've just come out. Why? He said, oh, we've had a bit of trouble down the road. He said, oh, yeah, what's that got to do with us? He said, well, you two fit the discretion. <laughs> I thought, fuck it, well, you ain't going to talk your way out of there, are you? 
in the end, he's asked to look in the bag. And my me, and me mates arguing the toss with him, you know, uh, outraged that you're asking some look in somebody's bag. Like, like, yeah, give him the fucking bag, let him have a look. All I want to give is me a gun, you know. <laughs> and I got it, stuck the driver up. He's my mate, the co driver. Got him out, left him handcuffed to the railings with their own cuffs and fucked off with a patrol car. So as you come to this uh, dual carriageway, the traffic's going like the clap as you can't get out. So I thought, oh, really? no, 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 no. Put the old blue light on and the, and the siren. And it was great. And then halfway down the road, the radio burst in life, made me jump. I, I was kind of trying to drive like that, but not touch the grip the steering wheel. They said, all units, all units, Tango 4. Just been hijacked by two gunmen, believe he headed towards Cannon Town. So we just hit a roundabout, and Cannon Town was that way. But oh, thank you very much for you. So he chucked a right, you know, and yeah, we parked it up somewhere, got out, jumped on the bus going by, got up to the top deck. As we sit sitting down in the top deck, <laughs> The old Sweeney's come round the corner on two wheels and the co-driver's got his arm out of him and posing and all that. As I've looked down at him, he looks up. So I said to my mate, I said, fucking hell, I ain't going to mention his name, but I think they got us. What do you think? He said, he went, fucking hell. He said, we'll have to hijack the country bus now. <laughs> and that was it. But we didn't. They was just posing, you know. Jumps off, got a mini cab, was away. When was this? After the murder or before? Oh, before. So this was just a job beforehand? Yeah, yeah. When you've done a robbery, took the copper? Yeah. Handcuffed him up, stole his car? Yeah. Oh, sake, I, I, think that has, I think that had a great deal to do with the length of time they made me do. Um, when I said that they would have fucking filled me full of holes if they called me that night, well, this was even worse because we had to go on ID parade for everything that went off in the England and the home counties for the last two stretches. So these two cousins come along, and they're supposed to tap you on the shoulder if they recognise her. Well, this cunt tried to throw me a left hook. I just back there and his fist whistled past my chin. I went, you weren't so fucking brave on the day, mate, was you? You know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 What did you get so, for that? Well, it didn't. I, in the end, I just got a life sentence for the for the shooting. Was that just before the shooting? Yeah. So you, when you got the ID parade, did the so they decided to, to put all that sign and die, not worth because um, you can't do more than life, can you? Oh, so you done the I was it the ID parade after the shooting? Yeah. So you never, oh, yeah, yeah, I'm yeah, thinking yeah. you've been caught and then yeah. you've done an IBD parade then you've maybe been let uh, out. No, we never got caught on any bit of work. Yeah. Uh, the guy you were with, did he ever get well, caught? Apart from that shooting, we wouldn't have got caught on that either, you know. Yeah. So what, when you're going through court, John, what, what's going through your mind? Did you, were you done bank your rights, gun caught at DNA? Was there DNA then, back in the day, 40, 50 years no, ago? No, I don't think it was. Did you still wear um, gloves though when you were going out in the graft? No, didn't wear masks. Fuck all. What? They, they had very little There's cameras. There's no fucking cameras. No. Or fuck all that. What we did do, we had a barbers that used to make wigs and beards out of her own hair, uh, or, or we had to get a theatrical person to go and get us certain prosthetics, you know. Mm -hmm. But um, no, we, that was why we could go work in the summer, you know. We dispensed with the shotguns, bought handguns and shoulder holsters. We didn't bother going stealing cars to put on the roof for changeovers. We bought them out the evening news mm -hmm. straight. You could have a dodgy license, be tooled up, and you could stay in the pool. You know. So I'm good friends with Old Razor Smith. Oh, well, I know, right? He, he writes for the inside time. Yeah, man. legend, man. Like, he yeah. couldn't read or write, changed his life in prison. Now he's got his own publishing company. Like, yeah, he's unbelie done well. Unbelievable yeah. man. Like, changed his life. I think his son committed suicide when he was in prison or died when he was in prison yeah. and decided enough was enough and changed his life. But he used to go out in jobs himself. 
Yeah. He, went, he, can. he, he gave a present, they gave him no money. If you've got the confidence yeah. in yourself, you, you can go to war with anybody, you mm -hmm. know. Because he came out of prison, they gave him no money. They could usually get money to get home or get some food. Yeah. They gave him fuck all. And they 43 said, quid yeah, that gave me. He put a bag over his head and went into his bank and just fucking tanned it. Yeah. They get out of prison. What was that? Is that an adrenaline kick then for you to then keep doing that? If yeah. you've got all the dough, was there ever a target in your mind? Because you know yourself, we always, everybody's greedy. We yeah. always want more. Was there never a target to say, right, fuck this, I'm going to make this and then shoot to Europe? No. Or were you just... So we both bought houses. He, he bought a nice house in Edmund. I bought one in Walderside in Kent. Cash? We, so, yeah. So we got... It was all feared out with the best furniture I had the garden landscape landscapes and all that and uh we decided to retire so we said yeah okay we'll retire and like live on what we got so I'm sitting at home out in the garden and I'm looking at the neighbors I thought you boring bastards you know they just uh, I thought if only you know <laughs> And I, I couldn't stand the boredom. It, it, it somehow got to me. The adrenaline is, is a powerful drug, you know. So now, it, two weeks went by, all of a sudden I got a phone call from my pal. He went, how you doing, John? I said, to tell you the truth, mate, I'm fucking bored shitless. He said, so am I. He said, fuck it, get the tools out, we're going to work. And that was it. Our retirement lasted two weeks. I don't know. I don't know who who can tell you why. What was the thrill like? Is it the thrill of being in control, or is it the thrill of making more money, or like the no, thrill? It, f for me personally, it was the thrill of beating the system and doing something well. It, it's like I'm a I'm a carpenter. I, I can't leave a job unless I've it's perfection to me. You know, nothing else will suffice or give me satisfaction. So I might spend an extra three days on a job, whereas another one would go bish bash bosh and leave it at that, take the money and run. For me, it's a pride in the work, you know. Even in prison, if I was cleaning toilets, so I had to clean them properly. Uh, Many jobs did they have you down on, in doing? That was the only job I would accept, cleaner. No, for the coppers, when you get caught, how many banks did they say that you'd done? Oh, um, well, they didn't bother prosecuting with them. You're getting a life for anyway. Yeah, yeah. But did they say that? Yeah. Is there a number? Well, they haven't got the full number. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's why I asked what number did they say. <laughs> did they uh, give a certain number? Because obviously, if it's yeah. a two man job, they must have known straight away, right? Yeah. There's not many banks being done by two. See, in, in the case that I. Unlikely, who would have gotten an acquittal on the murder, they would have... There's a good chance you'd have probably got a leafer for that. Well, not really. No, no one got killed or, uh, or anything. Fucking take a cause a hostage, old man, stealing his car. Yeah, but so I, I don't have this silly admiration for people in uniform that my, most people have. You know, say, oh, you, you can do anything, don't judge a prison or sort of that. Strip them naked, the same fucking cunts as we are, you know. Anybody that takes a liberty with other people deserves what they get, whether they're in a uniform or they're not. How does That's it feel sure. when you were getting bullied when you are younger from the screws and in Boston and that, but then you eventually become like a bully? Are you going into banks and that as well? Which, like you're doing that no, and putting fear was, into people's I lives? I wasn't a bully. I was very sensitive to people's reactions, and I even calm, used to calm down a few guards, you know, because a couple of them got really frightened. Oh, I've got my forgets, mate. And Take it easy, relax, mate. Everything's going to be all right. It's not your money. Did anybody ever try and become a hero? No. Because you have to establish, you have to put your foot down on that immediately yeah. to remove that from the equation. You know. the guy I'm from from Porso man he dressed up as a copper went into the post office they were letting him in and making them tea and while he was doing <laughs> that he was fucking just raiding it all I think he yeah. got away with 70 grand and that was back in the early 80s just made them yeah. all tea but then obviously when it says right it made them all feel calmer 
but then again the trauma will still hit them as well that did you ever think about that as the years pass on like all those banks going in and people screaming like does that ever play in your mind as well john i it does I, it does because you're not you're not really aware of it at the time but on reflection you look back at your past you think god i must have been a right fucking arsehole you know some of the things i've done in that but um I don't know. I've I've made reparation wherever I can in certain certain things. You know, uh, obviously you, you can't repair a lot of the damage you've done. But um, I don't know. It's like someone asked me today about. I mean, I was approached by a Scotland Yard at the beginning of my sentence, and normally you wouldn't entertain having an interview with them, but I was intrigued, you know, I wanted to know what they knew. So I agreed to this uh, visit. And uh, they, they offered me five years in Chiswick Police Station in a suite of cells where you could live in comparative luxury, have your girlfriend or your wife or whatever, have booze, uh, if I cops up my pals. If I if I gave them information on all me bank robbing friends, we well, you know what my answer was. I ended up doing forty three streams. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, yeah, there's not many people. Would have how done many that people time. would have bit their fucking arm fucking off? Fucking right, they would have. Know? There's no yeah. loyalty nowadays. But what they don't realise, I remember because Bertie Smalls was the first one, right, with our Wembley bank robbers. He traded all these pals. In for, I don't even know if he's still alive, but can't, I hope he ain't. But to me, it's more important to walk along that street and hold your head up and knowing that nobody can point a finger at you. That, that's more than any man of prison or money. I'll do this sentence all over again. And they, if they threaten me with it, if I won't give them names or whatever. I'll do it all over again. I think no hesitation. I think that's why you're respected, though. I think that's why there's no oh, many... No. Like, I mean, that, you know yourself, in that in that game, there's no loyalty anymore, especially nowadays. No, but, that, James, if you can't live with yourself, you, you might as well be fucking dead anyway. Yeah. Because that, that guilt will eat you from the inside out. So, seeing you're going through court, how long did the court case last? Uh, three, just over three weeks. I Did think. they offer you a deal? Nah. To plead? Nah. nah. Were you done buying your rights? Um, I suppose with all the evidence there and the witnesses, yeah, it was pretty. I still pleaded not guilty. <laughs> <laughs> still trying to fight the yeah. system. I think the jury come back with, um, in the end, the. He couldn't get a unanimous verdict. So it ended up 11 to 1, I think. So it's pretty yeah. strong odds, yeah, isn't it? Fuck. Yeah. But the judge was a bit of a prick. He made a birdie of me straight away. Like, where's my pal? He only ended up doing a 14 stretch out of his life sentence. So I'm in the witness box, and the, the judge uh, said, Would you like a glass of water, Mr. Massey? I thought, Yeah. I said, yes, I would. Thank you. And he's made this business of pouring a glass of water. And he's got a hand at me and he's pulled, he's pulled it back lively. Poured the water into a plastic cup. I thought, you cunt. You know what I mean? He's made me look like an animal, like a wild animal. I'm not trusted with a glass. Who was it going through the court case? Was that, was it Charlie Higgins? Yeah. Was his family there? I don't know. I was only conscious of uh, any family men, members of Charlie Higgins um, at Old Street's Magistrate Court and he, his sister. And I've never forgot it. She was uh, in the public gallery, which was the same level as the court, you know. And as uh, we got, um, what they call it? Um, 
not convicted. Uh, oh, you have to go to the magistrates before you go to high court, don't you? So anyway, we finished with that on the way out, and she, there was this woman that was, you could see the pain in her face and the tears, and she said, I've said something to me, and I leaned for and she spat at me. And I turned out to be his sister. And uh, I, I really felt sorry for her all these years. Yeah, because I, I know how my own family felt about me. You know. um, I never ever saw that pain again when I was in Monsef, before I was sentenced. And I got the news that my brother, Terry, had committed suicide. And he, he was only 10 months younger than me. And uh, he, uh, we'd wrote, written a couple of letters and uh, we were quite close. We sort of shared a bedroom sort of most of our life, you know. Well, you had their fights that I'm even so very sure shirt you're wearing and who sucks and all that. But, you know, I loved him a bit, but... And uh, anyhow, they, they took me to a chapel where my family was. And uh, I remember my sister, especially my oldest sister, Carol, she was an absolute bitch, you know. It was the same look on her face as Charlie Egan's sister. Why? Why? Because they both lost a brother. Does she blame you? Who? Your sister. Oh no, no! It was over oh, yeah, for yeah. the loss of my brother mm -hmm. Terry. So I'm now the only surviving male in the family, well, with my dad. Like so, but what they that gave me was a secret weapon in prison, really, because uh, I knew that I, as low as I ever got in prison, and there were some bad, dark times in prison. I could never do what my brother did. I could never inflict that pain on them twice. You understand what I mean? So that left me with, although there were many times I wanted to die, I wanted to end it or pull the plug or whatever, but I couldn't, I couldn't do that to my family. But that left me with the secret weapon, no fear. I didn't give a fuck about dying. If the schools wanted to come and beat me up, I'd, I'd meet you face, head on. And that's why they caught an handle in prison. They, uh, I wouldn't give in, no matter how much they hurt me. I thought it was legitimate to die in combat, as it were, but no way would I ever do it to myself. Which was which gave me that weapon of absolutely fearless in the, in the eyes of the squad. Where you got a lot of prisoners curl up into a ball in the corner. Oh, please, sir, no more. No, no. Fuck all that. Give him, you know, until you're unconscious. And then when you wake up, give him again. If, if a screw come to my door and you open it, and ask, I could tell immediately by the demeanour on his face. Whether it come to give me grief or, yeah. Because if a school said good morning to me, good morning, it'd be the hardest thing in the world for me not to say good morning back. But if he come to give me grief for that, I'd, I wouldn't even bother waiting to find out. I'd jump up straight away and stick a nut on him. they go, oh, what'd you do that for? Because you're about to do it to me, you can't. And they did. What was it like when you got your guilty, John? I remember, I remember my legs feeling like jelly when I was sentenced. When it kind of, uh, the import of it sort of hit me like a like a cost, you know. But um, then you got to face your your partner and your mum and your dad and your sisters and yeah. Uh, it was all very emotional time. What did they give you, 23? No, they gave me a life sentence with a minimum of 20. 
So that means there's no maximum. So when I did get the I when I came to the 20-year review, they gave me a brown envelope with a knockback in it, saying you're not getting it. I thought, fuck it. That was when I made my first escape. After the 20 years? Yeah, I thought, they ain't going to let me out. Fuck it, I'll let myself out. How many prisons were you in that 20 years? Oh, I lost count. I've been in every virtually every prison in the country, except Whitemore. I remember being transferred from... Um, Long Line in a 52 seater coach with about eight screws, just me, on the way to Whitemore. I think we get about 100 miles or whatever, and the radio's coming up. No, we done one in here. So they tried to park me up other prisons. The answer kept coming back, no, we done one in here. So I said to them, like, no, no one fucking wants me. Drop me off at the nearest bus stop, you know. But in the end, I ended up in Winston Green in Birmingham. And, uh, because well, when you was cut out in the early days, you got moved every three months anyway. So that you couldn't sell. Or if you was digging a tunnel, you couldn't finish it, you know. Like. <laughs> <laughs> did you ever come across Charlie Bronson? Yeah, I did, yeah. What was he like? I've, I don't really want to talk about him. Yeah. Because I fell out of him. And I'm still pissed off with him to to this day. Thank so you. a little said about that about. Yeah. What about when you done your twenty stretch then? Did you have it in your mind that there's a possibility you could have got out? I suppose if I'd have towed the line and been a choir boy or whatever and did the yes for no sir three bags full, I probably would have but okay, it's impossible. Did you do any courses or anything for behaviour? Nah. Oh, I, I did, like, the basic R&R, &R, whatever they call it, but most of the work, I've got other people to fill the forms in, you know. Mm -hmm. I just couldn't be arsed with it. Because in, uh, unless you go, and they're a complete waste of time. You, you, you get prisoners that are artists there, you know, and they can sell through these courses like, well, it's Greece, but but me, uh, you got to be devious to do that, you know. You got for well, fuck it. What you see is what you get with me. Or uh, if it, if they don't like the answer, that's too bad, you know. Mm -hmm. That's the answer I'm giving. Did you, Did you think you were going to die in prison? Not as long as I had breath, no, mm -hmm. because I thought there's always escape. Yeah. Although a few prison governors did threaten me with that. They said, like, you're going to end up dying in prison. Did you ever see prisoners get killed by yeah, the screws? Absolutely. Yeah. And every single fucking time the screws come out whitewashed. Unbelievable. Clean it up, so I it's mean, an accident. It, Belmarsh well, was, was with Jimmy, right? They called me off the exercise yard for a moody spin. They called it DST. There were a group of screws that wore paramilitary-style uniform, like the long boot, angled boots and the, all the patch pockets, all the gizmos, and all fucking muscle band, all on steroids, doing weight training and all that. I was what? See, I, well, I was old of it, age pension at the time. So they called me off the exercise yard for a moody spin. As I've got my sweatshirt halfway on my head, they steamed into me. And they fucking pummeled me for about a quarter of an hour. And you know the sick part about it? The guy that did the worst out, he threw the punch from behind. Can I mention his name? Yeah. Am I going to get... I don't give a fuck if he sues me anyway. No. I've got fuck all. <laughs> His name is Carl Morning. Muscle band, cunt. <laughs> yeah. His face was the poster boy on the anti-violence posters. How sick is that? And yeah, I ended up uh, later meeting a couple of women in Rochester prison who were married to a principal officer 
in Belmarsh. And the stories they told me about the violence, the way he hit her over the head with plates and fucking broke the, you know, frying on punches and animals. These steroids they're taking to build up their, they affect you. A lot of people, they make you violent, don't they? Mm-hmm. Well, that's what I've heard anyway. But this group of, group of uh, animals called the DST, they used, actually perpetrated the violence. Respond, you know, they go up to a prisoner and just hit him on the chin and when they react, oh, I'll blow the whistle, press the bell, they'd be all be on them. Like, when they done me that day, they, they banged everyone up so nobody could see what's going on. So when um, I tried to nick him over it, Belmarsh is the most secure prison in the country. They house the worst of the worst in Belmarsh. They got cameras every fucking two foot. It, they couldn't pull up one single frame of CCTV footage when I got smashed up. Unbelievable. Did they break anything? No, they tried to. It was only my experience in that sort of like rough house and my fitness that I survived. I mean, I was 66 and I think any any other 66 year old can, he, would, he wouldn't have made it. Why did they do that? Because of my escape from Pentonville. It How was long? payback. Because there was a governor at um, Pentonville, a black woman called Jenny Lee, Jenny Lewis or something like that. She met me in Belmarsh reception. I was banged up in a cell away from the other prisoners because I was Kai. She's opened the door and I thought, oh, hello, Miss Lloyd. She said, Massey, a lot of people want to kill you. I said, what for? I said, it was nothing personal. I went to see me. I had to go and see me. Mum, uh, you wouldn't let me. I got there. I did it. She said, you ruined a lot of lives. So obviously there was an extreme bad feeling about it, you know. I don't know if the governor got the sack or whatever. Because when I escaped, I escaped during a security audit. And that ain't supposed to happen. You know, nobody escapes during a security audit. So obviously uh, heads had to roll. I said, well, if you was doing your fucking job probably, I wouldn't have done it, would I? <laughs> I'm like, why have a go at me? It's your fault. So she sicked the other people onto me. That's my firm belief anyway. So seeing your first 20 years, was did you have anything in your mind that there was a possibility you could have escaped or were you thinking, try and do the 20 years as clean as possible so you can get out? No, no, no. My, um, no, matter, no matter what institution I've ever been in, my first thought is how to get out. And to me, it's a natural... Uh, I've, I've always said, look, you put any living creature in a cage, what's it do? It fucking circles every inch of that cage looking for a weakness to get out. It's a natural instinct. Even like salmon swimming upstream, you, you know, even a plant, you wouldn't ded- uh, dedicate it as having an intelligence. Put it in a dark corner, it will grow towards the light. You can't legislate against human nature, can you? But they they want to put penalties like 10 years in prison if you try to escape or it just goes against the grain. So your first escape was 20 years later? Yeah. How did you plan that? Um, I managed how I did it. I can't really remember that, but my dad had, um, he had a stroke and he was in a wheelchair. And they allowed me a compassionate escorted visit, which made it easy, you know. So I had, I had some pals ready waiting to meet me in it. And uh, I spent a month laid down in the flat before I went to, got transported to Spain. 
How did you get into Spain? Car? Boat? Well, originally me and Pal had hired these two young pilots to fly me into Belgium. But they were a couple of fuckers, they were. <laughs> <laughs> so we had, had, had this long drive down at Dover Airport yeah. and they got this fucking cheap old Cessna. And I looked at it, I thought, fuck it, I, I, I don't like planes anyway, but this thing looked like it was all together with bailing wire, you know. As luck would have it, uh, air traffic control come out and said, look, listen, boys, it's too blustery across the channel. We had ripped your wings off today. You, you know, you won't be able to fly today. Oh, I thought, well, oh, thank you for <laughs> So now I've got the choice. We've got to drive all the way back to London, back to the safe house. I thought, well, I could get nicked on the way. We could get a pool on the way back, you know. I said, fuck it, go to the pool. Let's have a get a feel of it, see if you can buy a couple of tickets for the ferry. So uh, he said, Oh, that's all right, we'll put you in the boot. I said, Fuck away, it's first base. He said, Look. He said, No, we've done it loads of times. A couple of the right herberts, these pilots. So I think they had five grand each to fly me, and a couple of tickets is cheap, isn't it? Mm -hmm. So, um, I went, I'm oh, going all right then, but drive somewhere where no one can see me get in the boot. But just as I was about to pull away, like the, the alarms went, I went, no, 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 nick that. I said, show me your passports. They give me the passports. So I put theirs, I've got a dodgy one. I put mine in the middle, trying to see if I get any vibes that mine's a bit iffy. Felt all right, I said, fuck it, go and buy three tickets. Anyhow, we got to the customs control bit. What was the first thing the woman said? Can we have a look in the boat? <laughs> <laughs> oh, you fair of cunts. Uh -huh. Oh, I'd have been well nicked, you know. But it went sweet as luck. Got through all right. Where did you go? How did you get in? Uh, so we went to Cali. In the boat? Eh? No, no. No, normal. Just sitting normal? Normal, yeah. So you you were going to go in the boot, but yeah. then you tried it out. Changed the mind, yeah. yeah. fuck that. Yeah. They always like the boot. Exactly, yeah. Do you think they'll try to get you caught? Oh, I don't know. I think they're just too green and stupid. On the way to fucking Paris, they try to sell me the car. Fuck <laughs> oh, <man. laughs> Yeah. So what, what happens then when you get through? you thinking, I'm going to make a new life for myself and try and keep the head down? Yeah. Or are you thinking, I'm going to well, get a bit no, of luck? it was kind of impossible with me because, um, you know, what, what could I do legally? I'm in a strange country. For, never been out of England ever in my life before. But Palmine set me up with some people that in a, got me this six-bedroom villa where it was like, Passing up, puff, you know, loading it on the lorries and getting back there. It was a good life. A good money. Good luck. How long were you there for? Um, well, in Spain. Yeah. Well, I was, I was two years free in uh, Port Buenos, Marbella. I spent the next five years, uh, three years in Spanish prisons. They caught you there, huh? How did they catch you? Oh, it was just like deja vu, it was. So I, um, and it, it's very, uh, still very sore for me as well. I had a baby, I had a baby boy by my partner, and uh, he died. Uh, they called it cold death. Sorry to hear that. Yeah. And, uh, Anyhow, so me and the girl were out drowning our sorrow sort of thing. We stopped at this uh, bar in Fingerola. She was obviously upset. I said, look, you go to the toilet, clean yourself up, I'll order a drink. So as I've ordered a drink, she had to walk past. The pub was empty except for these three guys sitting in the corner. As she'd gone past them, one of them said, uh, what's the matter, darling? Is that kind of upset you? I've, I've heard it. I've heard, so I take no notice of them pricks. Uh, God. And next thing I know, one of come up behind me, smashed me in the back of the head with a stool. And then one's run around the bar and bubbled all the doors. So obviously they want to lock me in there and chew me up like a banjo, you know. 
But I, they picked the wrong fella that night. So, and I left them all on the fucking deck and ended up getting charged with attempted murder. And they attacked me. Yeah. How long did it take to get extradited? Uh, three years. Did you want to stay in Spain or did you want to go back I home? I can absolutely, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Where yeah. do you think? Actually, I got, I got extradited the same as my mate, Kenny. Kenny Noy, we got next out there as well. And uh, in the end, they ended up putting us in separate prisons. Yeah. And they come for me at three o'clock in the morning, the Guardia Seville, fucking machine guns and everything. Type out a lot, check it and put me in the back of the car. I'm off to the airport. Yeah, they don't fuck about no. that. Lot. Did we ever any hassle in the Spanish jails? They tried it if you like, because being a foreigner, you were, you you're a bit of a. They consider you prey, don't they? But I put my foot down straight away. And, 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 and they nicknamed me Loco Inglés, like the man the Englishman. But, but it's all right. If I had to choose between doing bird here or in Spain, I'd choose Spain every day. Why? Because you've got that air of hope there. They have a fiesta at a drop of a hat. They have ambulances every now and again. Do you not get your missus in as well? Life sentence doesn't exist. Mm-hmm. Can you not get your bird in as you well? You can have conjugal visits, yeah. Fuck it, innit? Yeah. There's no work. You're out in the sunshine all day, every day. You've got a little shop built into the wall. What more do you want? How much does alcohol play in your downfall, John? Obviously, uh, it, pl- it pl- in played a great deal. Although I'm not, I'm not a heavy drinker by any means. I very rarely drink more than three pints a month now, you know. But then I was always that. Uh, yeah, you know, when you're young, you're clubbing it and pubbing it and pissing it all out the wall, you know. Um, so if I wouldn't wouldn't drink it that night, all this would never have happened. You know, I, I do think of that now and again, but. That's what it is, isn't it? Yeah. And and when this other incident happened in Spain with a free guy, and they turned out to be free Englishmen as well. I thought, fuck me, I'll come all this way to fucking Spain to have a rowdy free Englishman, you know. And they tried to claim compensation. All the fuckers, they locked all the doors and they wanted to chew me up so I couldn't escape. You know, you like, if you... You've just lost a child, and you're, you're plus you've got a bit of whiz up your ear, and like, they pressed the wrong buttons, you know. What was it like when you get extradited back? Fucking horrible, yeah. Um, I think I got met it. Oh, Scotland Yard come and got me, and I was double cuffed on the plane. Couldn't eat me fucking dinner probably on the plane because <laughs> of the cuffs. I, f- I thought about causing a scene and all that, get the cuffs off. And, then, um, and we got into Heathrow and they wished me straight off to uh, Wandsworth. And there, I could sense the animosity straight away there. You know. Was that you and Bat and Catty again? Yeah, Catty and Catty. Yeah. Did they, did you get an add on? What was the add on for that? Um, I don't think I did an extra six or seven years. Was it worth it? Fucking right. <laughs> I, yeah, I got to see my mum. Mm-hmm. No one can ever take that away from me. Um, and now, as I said before, if you start regretting things and you want to change things, you could then that means you've got to change everything. And obviously, you'd like, you like you can't pick and choose; just change the bad bits, you know. You've either got to accept it, all of it, or not at all. I wouldn't change anything. You escaped four times, but it was the four times not because of all family issues? Yeah. What was, it, what was the second time you escaped for? 
Well, they, oh, my sister, Carol, eldest sister, I got a message. I was actually, and it wasn't what I'd class as an escape anyway, because I was in open prison, Ford, which where I eventually got banned from all open prisons. So I had to go to this Warren Hill, you know. Um, I got a message that she wanted to see me. And if you knew my sister Carol, she would, that would strangely be very out of character. She would never ask. You know, so I knew it was serious. She was in intensive care in the Royal Free. So I went straight to the governor, asked permission to go and see her. I think I'm in open prison, you know. No. I said, well, give me an escort visit then. I don't care. You know, you got to use six screws. Away. I just need to see her. You know, sorry, but you can't spare the staff. I thought, well, fuck you, I'm, I'm going. The, the call was too strong, you know. And yeah, she died two weeks later. So I wouldn't change the thing, no. I got to see her. You got to spend that two weeks See, with her. I I never forgot the day my brother died. I didn't get to say goodbye. You know that has hurt me f to this day. Forty forty three years later, forty six years later. So, if ever there's a chance, you know you know every time you have a phone conversation with a loved one. You always end that conversation by saying, I love you. Or you leave the home, you leave the house. All right, see you later, love you. They may be the last words you'll ever say to them. And if you did do that, and something bad did happen, it pulled you to pieces for the rest of your life. You see what I'm getting at? Yeah. So when you was, when you spent your two weeks with your sister, did the coppers know you were there? Did they just leave you alone? Um, f that was strange. I, I did sense there was activity around there, but I did a bit of reconnoitering around the hospital and, that and slipped in quietly. But I did, um, I think I was lucky more than anything. Yeah. So if you're in your open prison, John, are you not then close to being getting released? Of course. Of course. But how can you not go and see your sister you're very close to as, who's dying, basically? To me, that's, that's cruel. Yeah, I would have done the same. That's inhumane. I would have done the same. Yeah. Which is what happened in the case of my mum. Or well, I had to escape from Pentonville. I don't, it doesn't matter where I'd have been at the time, I would have made an attempt wherever it was. And this is the third time you escaped? Yeah, or whatever. I can't remember really. So every time you've escaped is to go and see a loved one who was dying? Well, the other one wasn't an escape. I was actually, I got released to a hostel. I was only out three weeks. My dad was dying in Royal Free again. So we're at his bedside, the whole family is at his bedside. And in the event, I was actually the last one my dad spoke to. Everyone was asleep and I saw him take his last breath. But when I phoned up, I was the doctor came in to tell us the news, look, we don't think your dad's going to last the next 24 hours. So I did the dutiful thing. I phoned up the hostel, told them the circumstances. I said, look, I'm staying with the rest of the family by my dad's bedside. He's only got hours left in it. No, Mr. Massey, you've got to come back here and observe the 11 o'clock curfew. I said, go on, fuck off. Put a phone. They recalled me to prison for that. And uh, well, basically, basically, yeah, number ten stretch. It's not even a crime. I can't whisk you off the street for disobeying an order, can I? 
and give you a 10 strokes. But again, if you're doing a life sentence. Yeah, because you're a lifetime. I'm on a bit of string. Mm -hmm. I can yank on that bit of string any time they like and take it back. Although in my case, I don't think they want me back in a hurry, but, but it's feasible they can do that. Can you see why you are, though? What? On a bit of string with them. Yeah, but I think anything short of violence, they, they'd they have a strong time justifying dragging me back to prison. Because no matter what you've done, John, like, you can see you're still a good guy, you're loyal, and my, I've got a heavy heart for you, but I also feel as if you've got a heavy heart you're on, you're carrying a lot of pain. Oh, I've got a lot of baggage, yeah, but, um, you know, yeah. Sometimes I feel the weight of it is is gonna drag me down, but I, it's like talking to people like yourself. You you should kind of give me a little bit of renewed energy, you know, because uh, you, you've been there, you know what it's all about. But a lot of other people don't understand. They don't understand prison circumstances from programs like Porridge, or you know, mm -hmm. which is. It's so far removed from reality, it's untrue. But you must be one of Britain's longest serving prisoners. Well, I was before I was released. But I think now Charlie Bonds has overtaken me now because he's still in there, isn't he? How hard is that for you to try and like talk about it and being in prison for that and missing family time? Like, How hard is that for a man who spent so long in prison knowing that you're clearly still a family man and you're clearly carrying a lot of regret and pain? But how difficult is it because for anybody watching it's maybe wanting to get involved in a life of crime I think they're a bad man like, I think you're a prime example that crime doesn't pay well, of course it doesn't pay well, well one of my good friends I used to like, be bank robbing with one of the leading members of, of a London crime family he said to me a couple of months ago he said John he said if we'd have gone to work straight all these years instead of going on the pavement, he said we would have saved all that grief and we'd have had more money than we got that than we ever got out of that. Which is true. Yeah. How's your relationship with Kenny Noy though? Because Kenny's a high profile name as well. Yeah, scene. no, I, I, I always seen it be defending his name, Kenny, because I've always found him a nice guy and a gentleman. But all this shit that's been brought about him, because he killed a cousin and that, obviously, uh, he's under threat all the time, isn't he, from the other people. But um, to me, I've, I think he was a nice guy. And I've never known Kenny to be violent except on defence. And in both cases where he killed that cousin, he jumps up out of a hole in the ground and whacks him out here with a pistol butt and he stabbed him. You're virtually fighting for your own life in them certain. It's not murder, is it? The guy, they think they're James Bond, some of these C-17 people. He dug a foxhole in his, in his garden out in Kent to keep surveillance on him for the gold bullion. Remember it? Yeah. And uh, Kenny happened to be out in the garden walking the two dogs who they misappropriated named Brinks and Matt. <laughs> and the dogs sensed the guy in the garden. He's jumped up out of the hole. Well, I don't call that, man. I call that self-defence. They had the masks and that on as well, did they not? Yeah, he's balaclava that, everything. Frightening, terrifying situation. You don't know who the fuck he is, do you? Might be coming in, might be an assassin or whatever. What's the worst prison you've been in, John? Armley. Why? I didn't even have to think about it, did I? No. Armley in Leeds, because they beat the fuck out of me there and left me unconscious and left me with amnesia. I got transferred there from Wakefield where they try to fit me up with stolen keys. They come and drag me out of bed at three o'clock in the morning in my underpants, 
cuffed me, slung me on the van, took me to Armley. And all I got out of them was, you cockney cunt. I, uh, you're not a fucking gangster up here, mate. I, all that shit through the spiral. And they kept a red light on all night. Um, because I was, they said because I was K. I said, I was K in the other jails. They never kept a fucking red light on. Or, and then they wouldn't turn it off. I'd smash it off the ceiling. And then proceeded to smash the whole fucking cell up. And they said through the space, well, we'll be in in the morning, we'll fucking break your back and all that. I said, well, come on then. And you know, I got as prepared as I could do, but they overwhelmed me. And they dragged me down a strong box, but as they dragged me down the stairs, they they let my head hit every step on the way fucking down. You know, it was one of their tactics. And you know, I don't remember much after that. I woke up in a strong, what I knew was a strong box. It's like, you should call it, it goes under a few names, silent cell. It's like a cell within a cell. Have you ever come across them? No. So you got you got to go through one door before you get to another door, which is a cell. And all it is is bare concrete. You got a concrete post coming out of the floor for your chair, or maybe a tree stump or something like. That. And you got a concrete slab as your bed. And I woke up in that, and I'm, I couldn't remember my own name. It, it was weird, I, but, but I knew I was in prison. So I thought, how can I remember I'm in prison yet not remember my name or how I got here? That's strange, that. Mm -hmm. it, it was really weird. And I remember the silence, and I thought, and the silence was so silent, it was deafening, if you know what I mean. It kind of hurt my ears, it was so silent. Just white noise. Yeah, and that's what they'd done to me. And then they made me, and they put me into another strong box the next day, and I had to run the gauntlet from the strong box to the recess to empty my piss bar and all that, you know, where they bat me on going in and coming back. So the worst jail I've ever been, yeah, Armley. I wanted to set up a fucking machine gun nest outside when I got out and do a lot of them, but that's how much I hatred they instilled in me, you know. Mm -hmm. And because I was from London, uh, or a cockney, I said, oh, I really got a treatment. Yeah, because I had someone, uh, Sam Miller, he was in the IRA, and he called in the Blanket Boys 10 years every day, get a beating. Yeah. And he hated them. He says, I think a few of them got murdered, but he wanted more killed. And you can understand why they hate in the age. If you're getting beat up every fucking day, like, and, yeah. and abused and laughed at and tormented and you're going to be full of rage people's yeah. ego get dented if you just bang into them here did you ever see that film The Sleepers yeah uh, Brad Pratt the four young boys yeah. and they, they come well, back for revenge that's the kind of scenario yeah. I mean I've I've felt that and uh, in fact a few of my pals have had to talk some strong sense to me you know but because I still had that urge to get recompense you know but but nah. Get revenge. Yeah, but it's a monk's game, really. Yeah. So, so see, uh, after your 43 years, what was the, the run-up to be getting released, John? Were you in an open prison? No, because you never got an open prison anymore, did you? Because you escaped. No, so I think it was Blunkett who introduced uh, this new prototype prison. It's a bit of a guinea pig place where... It was closed, enclosed, but you had to do, get through three stages to be eligible for release. But you couldn't get home leave or any of the privileges you got in a Category D prison. So again, I got other people to fill all the forms in. I used to have the school come out and go, oh, that was very good, John. And I thought, yeah, well, I've never fucking done it. No. You know, it's a, it felt like uh, you got to break your own principles to go ahead with it, you know. And it, it all meant nothing. It was all sort of cosmetic stuff. 
in actual reality, it was all, it didn't mean a lot, you know. And I actually got one of the fastest releases ever known to a lifer. I've, I've never known anybody get released so quick. Because uh, I got a parole board coming up. That's why I grew this beard. I first grew this beard, I thought, fuck it, I've, all the other Pro Bowls I've had in the past, they got this young picture of me on the folder. They think, oh, he only looks young and fuck it, he can do another 10 strikes. <laughs> you know, I thought, well, this time I'm going in looking old and uh, I'm all getting slow and all that. And I got it, I've got parole. So I got a parole on a Monday. Now, you're supposed to wait 15 days before you get an answer. I got the Pro Bowl on a Monday. I got the answer on a Tuesday. I got kicked out on a fucking Wednesday. Never been known before. Because even after the 15 days waiting for the answer from the Pro Bowl, you got, then you got to wait a month or so for probation to set you up with a hostel and all that shit. So I was in and out three days. What was that for? I think like? I became an embarrassment. Hey, boy, I, I knew the MPs were even asking the question, why is this man still in prison? I know that Lord Ramsbottom, he, he did ask that. And the ex-prison governors were asking, they were making comments when I escaped, you know. And... Uh, it was kind of the overall view that they couldn't explain why I've served longer than any terrorist, any multiple fucking child killer, any rapist, pedophile, lunatic, even a guy convicted of genocide. I've served longer. Why? Basically, I went out for a drink on Friday night and never come home for 43 years. I never went out to change the world or overthrow the government or so why have I served longer than anybody else in England why have I become the longest serving prisoner it didn't make sense what was it like when you got parole yeah there was a guy that got released got parole the same time as I did David fucking McGreevy killed three children he was babysitting for decapitated them and stuck their heads on spikes on display. How come he's, he did 13 years less than me, how come he's not a danger to the public and I was? Which was always their answer when they knocked me back for parole. I'm a danger to the public. I've never been a danger to the public. Ever. What was it like when you got parole? What was that feeling like, John? Fucking brilliant. I still got a picture on my phone of the day I got out. Yeah, my sister and my niece come and pick me up and a family friend. And you look at that picture and you can see the pure happiness on my sister and niece's face. It's, and mine. It was great. It's a long time. Like, see, when you get out... Yeah. Did you ever think it was a bit too fast-paced here, too much that you were going to do something no. daft to go back in? No, no. No, because um, I didn't make the mistake of a lot of prisoners over the years. I, I wasn't content to lie in the bed, smoking puff and all that and forgetting about what I wanted to know what's going on in the world. I bought a paper every day religiously for years. Always turn the news on, the old Channel 4 news and I was like a sponge for information all the time, what's going on. So I never got left behind with the progress of the outside world. Because a million times, screws your governors say to me, oh, you'll find it strange when you get out, John, now. I mean, no, the only thing I fucking find strange is being in prison. That's the unnatural environment for me, not out of here. Yeah. And so when you get out, if you're keeping up with current affairs and politics and what's going on in the rest of the world, you, you're not suffering the culture shock when you come out. What did you do when you got out? Um, 
Well, I got, a, f a friend of mine gave me a, a van, a very good friend of mine, and I, I love my work, carpentry. I'm a carpenter. And uh, I started doing a bit of work carpentry. But then I wanted to... Um, I wanted to do everything legal, you know. I didn't want anybody to point out or pick me up on anything. So I spent £400 doing the courses to get a CSCS card. You know, it's a work card so you can get on building science and that. And I had this uh, friend who's got a company in Moorgate would have given me all the work I could had, or I could work seven days a week if I wanted. But it had to be straight, you know. I had to be with the cars on. And yeah, you know, I did a trial. I did half a day's work for him. All of a sudden, they stopped my pension for three weeks over Christmas period. I'm not allowed to work. And that is one of the grievances I still have to this day, because when I was released, they declared that I wasn't entitled to a state pension because I haven't paid any stamps all over the years. But when you consider it, I'm working for the Queen, right? It's under HMP, isn't it? I'm, I'm a fucking sewing mail bags, doing menial tasks and cleaning. Why is that not? Work in prison is compulsory. If you don't work, you get punished. Why is that not worth a stamp to entitle to me to a state pension? Can you answer that one? No. Well, that's what they're doing to me. No, still? Yeah, I'm not legally allowed to work unless I want to risk losing my media pension, which is a pittance. And you want to work? Huh? Do you want to work? I want to work, yeah. But obviously, yeah, I can't maybe do a full time. The effects of the stroke I've had, I'm getting tired now. It's becoming a struggle to talk. But, you know, a full working physical day, I don't know that I'll be able to do that. For people watching, a lot of people will offer you work and a lot of people want to do well for you. So I'm going to leave a yeah. link or some sort of email for yourself that people can be in contact with you. Like, I see a lot of goodness in you, John. Like, yeah. You're loyal to the fucking board. Well, funny, uh, let me bring up another. F I did this job for an American couple near where I live. They're very uh, well to do, and um, they wanted some bookcases built from floor to ceiling all the way around the room. So it was one of the first jobs I had since coming home and I thought I have to tell these people my background because I don't want them to find out from somebody else and then freak out you know so I put before I started work for them I told them so look um, I've just been released from prison I'm, I was I served a life sentence for, for murder blah 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 told them well, they left that house with me in there working on my own for the whole day. So, and you can't buy a feeling like that, that pleasure, that trust they put into me. That was the right thing I did was by telling them. And they was at ease with me from the word go. And to this day, they're very good friends of mine. And they asked me back several times to repair things and that. And to me, that's, you know, that's lovely. It boosts me up, it does. Yeah. Um, but you can see your lawyer. Because it, if anybody doesn't like where I've been or what I've done, they can fuck off. I'm not interested in them anyway. So I make a point now, if anybody's home I go into where I have to do a bit, I have to tell them where I'm from and what I'm all about, you know. Yeah, because I don't want them finding out by accident and freaking out and making their imagination mm -hmm. running wild. You can understand why some people would freak out as well. Oh, absolutely. I mean? That's why. I, that's why mm -hmm. I, I feel the need to tell them. You know. See, every Christmas and New Year, did it get easier or did it get harder as the years went on? Well, inside. Yeah. 
Uh, well, one of the things I did, which, which obviously affects me now that I'm out, and it it confuses a lot of people, is I have great difficulty remembering dates or times. Right? Because when I, when I was inside, I never used to have a calendar. I was aware of the dates for most of the time, but Monday through to Sunday, through to Christmas, Easter, to me it was just one long stretch of time. No one day was any special than the other. And that made it so easy for me. I never got traumatised for anniversaries of someone dying or whatever, like my sister do. I don't, because I don't know the dates. You know, for, for all the people I've lost, they're in here, they're with me forever anyway. I don't need a date to remember by. And... Uh, so time for me was just one big long streak. Otherwise, if you're going to mark off the daisies, it becomes an eternity. Mm -hmm. you know, you're, you're making things hard for yourself. When did you do the programme? Was it The Mind of a Murderer? No, it was called What Makes a Murderer. What makes, when did you do the programme, What Makes a Murderer? Um, I don't know. Again, I, I can't really say, I don't know whether it was a year ago or two years ago. What was it like? Um, well, I'm, they took me on location, like, uh, I think Birmingham University is where they did the brain scans. It was a scientific program um, to discover if there was any difference between my brain pattern and, and any normal person. And apparently they said there was, I, I have an, what was that word, medulla? Medulla. Mid, mid, yeah, he said mine is enlarged, which apparently, according to the scientists, was a psychopathic trait. I, I don't really believe a word of it, but. I can believe that maybe it's a sign that you've suffered trauma because they say that's where your feelings or emotions are, are based. And when, when you're traumatized, as you say, like when I was a child, it kind of shuts itself off. I don't know. No, he said it grows bigger than it. Or so. I don't know. It's all... It's all gobbledygook to me because, because at one point he put six brain scans on the table and asked me to pick one out that they had the most psychopathic traits in it. I picked one out. It turned out to be his, a scientist. So he's more fucking psychopathic <laughs> than I am. What is, the psycho what is the psychopathic traits? No empathy? Yeah, no lack of fear. You could say you have that one, though. Yeah, but I don't. I don't attribute that to being a psychopath. I attribute that to my brother. Mm -hmm. You know what? Is the psychopathic traits though? Was was there many? Or was it only a few? Well, again, again, lack of empathy. I think they got it wrong because, you know, as I say, I've sat and watched a soppy advert over chocolate and had tears rolling down my cheeks. No, I, I feel a lot of empathy. I feel a great deal of empathy for what's going on at the moment and in Ukraine. It's absolutely fucking horrendous, you know. And uh, so if lack of empathy was a psychopathic trait, that's not me. I'm not a psychopath. I don't believe. I think if you ha didn't have any empathy, I don't think you'd have escaped prison four times to go and see family members. No. I could envisage, given the right circumstances, being a selective psychopath. You know, if someone is threatening my family or, or is just a plain bad bastard, then I could become a lunatic myself. Anybody could, as we've said before. 
You know, you get mothers and fucking lift up a seven stone mother, lift up a car off her child. You know, that that's the type of strength it generates. It's got to be for the right reasons. You must have came across a few mad men though inside that were you never in why did they never send you to Broadmoor? Because I wasn't mad. <laughs> <laughs> Did they uh, ever try well, though? Actually, actually, I, I got quite worried about that one time because uh, during my stint at Parkhurst, you had this uh, psych uh, psycho doctor called Cooper, and used to be. I was on his work party. They used to call it Cooper's Troopers. He had the power to nut you off, you know. But I didn't realise by being on his party, I was I was under scrutiny. So, uh, but in the end, they found him running around the woods outside park was stark naked. He was a fucking lunatic yourself. Yeah, it's probably just sent people there and they'd be yeah. famous as well. But that's a type of abuse that went on years ago. Um, now it's pretty difficult to get someone put in a nut house. But there, one man's signature. Boss, you're off. Was enough. Yeah. How does it feel that talking about your story today, your past, family members? Yes, uh, I can feel um, it's it's drained me a, a, a bit. I feel kind of wiped out. Well, that's why I gave up trying to write my own book because I I got into circumstances where I'm reliving a certain memory. Uh, and it'd leave me like a wet flannel, you know. I got oh, fuck it, I can't do that. So in the end, I got this guy who works for the Camden Journal. I've dictated it to him, and he's written it. Yeah. Be a powerful book. It's a bestseller you've got. There, yeah. John. So uh, I've just been accepted for a deal with uh, history books. I was. Um, at first, going to go through Harper and Collins, but then the COVID crap hit and everything went pear-shaped. And then the uh, managing director, the editor, what was it, I forget her name, Kelly Ellis, she uh, become pregnant and get, went on maternity leave and it kept dragging on and on and on. And then... They wrote back and said they wanted this bit rewritten in the first person. And then, in the end, uh, I think they've, they're so big, the company, I think they haven't got the courtesy to answer your emails or inquiries or whatever. And you know, well, fuck it, let's go somewhere else. Mm -hmm. And this guy from History Books, he's very eager and very keen to write the story or to publish the story. Which is all I want. I want someone who's interested in it, not because they want to make money out of it, you know. What would the John of now say to the 20 year old John and from the past if you could give him advice? Oh, stick to your fucking carpentry and leave all the criminality alone. Yeah. 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 I, I have very strong regrets for that. I'm. I mean, in prison, I, I actually became badminton champ for over 40 years. And because uh, I remember my asking my dad one day, I was interested in playing tennis. He said to me, what do you want for your birthday, son? I said, tennis racket, dad. Well, you give me a cunt around a fucking ear hole and bought me a pair of boxing gloves, which was his passion, you know, boxing. And I used to say, point about McEnroe trip. I said, look, when you just won Wimbledon and got 150 grand, we, yeah, it was too late now, son, you know. But I, I think under the, I don't ever want to criticise my parents or be disloyal to them, but a lot of the way you grow up is who your parents are. And if they can open up their minds to what makes you tick, what your likes, dislikes, and passions are, 
instead of saying, no, we want you to be a lawyer, we want you to be a doctor, we want you to be this, that, the other, you'd be a success. Because you have to love what you're doing to be successful at it. And I loved holding a racket. But, um, and a shotgun. <laughs> <laughs> no, not really. <laughs> yeah, you've had some leaves, yeah. John. You've had some leaf, man. Like I prefer pistols to shotguns. Anyway. <laughs> but you can clearly see that like, you're still a good guy as well. Like all the fuck ups you've done, all the mistakes you've done, like you can still see that like, you've still got a, a heart, but like, you've still got remorse, you've still got empathy. Like, like to escape all those prisons to go and see your family. Yes, look, you put yourself in prison, you've got to take responsibility for that. As, but to the things that you've done and even coming on today and every time I've spoke to you, been nothing but nice. Like, how is yeah. it? I mean, even my girlfriend's had a go at me several times for giving money to beggars in the street, you know. But although a lot of them are scamming and they turned it into a business now and they're begging, but some of them are genuine, you know, aren't they? Yeah. And you do feel for them, but... Uh, where do you go for here, John, going forward for the future? I, li I literally don't know. Uh, it's uh, whatever happens, happens, you know. I just want to try and improve my health a bit more. Get back to the way I was and live the rest of my life in peace. For anybody that's maybe watching, that's maybe thinking about being a bad man or trying to be a gangster or think they're tough, what, what advice um, would you give for them? I, I've i got no fucking tolerance whatsoever for these wannabe gangsters or cardboard gangsters, as you used to call them, you know. It's all meaningless. It's all... Every, it's all the bad emotions that people... and vanity and glory... Just be humble and treat other people the way you want to be treated yourself. And because uh, uh, there are a lot of people that turn to crime, and they don't know where to draw the, that line, never to step below. You know, you have to, you have to have a limit. You, if you are determined to be a criminal. Put a limit on it, you know. Try and uh, keep it to the Robin Hood ethic rather than making everybody's life a misery and destroying things. Did the penny ever drop, John? Like when you were in prison, like all the stuff that you had done, and you came to a realization that you did cause a lot of pain. Or did that take time, or did you know instantly? <clears throat> No, it always came afterwards because once that fucking red mist comes down on you, you know, you after time you've done the damage before you've even realised it. It's afterwards. And uh, I don't know. I mean, I've had, I've had people... Uh, Look at me and think, oh, he, even even now, I think, oh, he, look at that old cunt. He's got a great beard, he's got a great mug. And next thing you know, you're looking up down there and when they're on the fucking deck and say, oh, I didn't mean it, mate. It's too fucking late now, isn't it? You know, I don't know. I don't even know what I'm talking about. So. <laughs> Before we finish up, would you like to finish up on anything, John? Uh, yeah, I'd like someone to uh, answer the question why I'm not entitled to a state pension after being forced to work compulsorily for 40 odd years for slave wages. Yeah, so I'll, leave a, I'll need to leave a link or an email address where people can contact See, you. If, if you're supposedly welcomed back into the fold and you've paid your debt to society, why is it then that I'm um, ostracised? I'm not allowed to say for it. I can't go on programmes like Who Wants to Be a Millionaire because of my past history. 
Ouais. Après, il montait. Et là, have you seen recently that certain criminals have won the lottery and there's this big clamour for somebody to want to grab it and deprive them of it and put it towards the victim's fund. The guy went and bought his ticket, the same money as you paid. Why is he not entitled to the winnings? You know? So you're never really welcome back. You'll always be known that as an ex-robber, an ex-killer, an ex-this, an ex-that. You, you never get accepted by society fully. How would you like to be remembered? For not giving in. <laughs> I think we'll finish up on that, John. Listen, for coming on today and telling your story, I thoroughly enjoyed it. It's it's been a mad roller coaster of emotions oh, in your whole obviously life. I couldn't cover all of it in this time. You can't cover 43 years in. Of course an hour you can't. Whatever, but. but we've got all the bits that I think people can know your story, understand you. And for anybody that's maybe wanting to help, I'll leave an email address that can maybe reach out, maybe try and get you a bit of work, maybe try and see what we can do with this pension because there's so many people who watch these programs that are willing to help people and yeah. give people a second chance and, and, and see where I've they can go. I've had a couple of uh, solicitors tentatively venture into it and but they all seem to get uh, dismayed by the I feel a lot of it goes back to the Factories Act in virtual almost medieval days where where prisoners had no rights the, but those laws should be looked at because we're now in the 21st century and they should be changed yeah yeah. John, I wish you all the best for the future. God bless you, and thanks for giving me your time today. Thank you, James. Take Been care. A pleasure.